Thank you. Um, happy to be here. Um, and today I'll tell you a little bit about these really uh, incredible uh, worm collectives or worm blobs that we've been studying for the last six, seven years. And you can see them in a video. They're happy in a, um, in a flask here and waving about in water. And I'll tell you why we're fascinated with them. Um, so my lab at Georgia Tech uh, essentially does curiosity-driven science in studying organisms. Um, we're a group of physicists, mathematicians, uh, engineers um, who really uh, look at organisms as nature's engineers and nature's physicists um, and essentially look at this through this lens to understand how organisms solve uh, physics, mathematics, engineering problems, and we kind of want to learn from them. Um, oftentimes, there is no application, which is perfectly fine for us. We're basically understanding it for the fun of it. Um, and uh, we kind of uh, follow the philosophy, uh, uh, kind of the Krog, philo Krog principle or the Krog paradigm, essentially, uh, which states that for every question that is an organism in which it can be uh, faithfully and properly studied, uh, such that you cannot study aerodynamics or flight by studying mice. Uh, essentially, for each of our questions, we are intellectually quite promiscuous and in our organismal choice, and we either find these bugs and or study these non-model systems across these lens scales and the spirit of physics of life. Uh, so we think about uh, single cells, uh, proteins, supramolecular proteins, so at the very small scales, all the way to organismal scales, so how we blink how organisms might uh, excrete, so how insects pee, to how organisms might stabilize in air, tiny, tiny arthropods, how flamingos might feed, all the way to collectives of cells that might talk to each other through hydrodynamics. And today's kind of star of the show, these worms that can uh, engage with each other through these topological tangles and even uh, projects ongoing at uh, dog scale. Uh, since there might be earlier career, but also uh, scientists uh, who uh, hopefully share the same idea that we all, <clears throat> uh, uh, some of us have. Uh, when I was a kid, I've always wanted to go to the rainforest and study bugs. And we've been going doing field work in the Amazon rainforest for the last seven years now. Um, so we wrote to NSF and uh, uh, we received this grant where we basically take early career students up to six to eight uh, each year. Um, uh, to ex expose them to studying organism in the natural context and not to study uh, systems in the lab. Uh, we just finished our year one cohort. It was amazing. We bring tools, we bring scientists, mathematicians, physicists, roboticists, and really do this curiosity-driven science and expose them to this idea that we can essentially uh, uh, be uh, uh, basically naturalist in 2023 and uh, bring our modern tools and find new systems and ask these questions. Um, so if you're interested in applying for this, we will have this cohort uh, again next year. And uh, as long as the funding uh, is there and as, as far as the rainforest doesn't burn down, we'll continue doing this. My central thesis today, uh, hopefully in the next 20 minutes or so, I'll try to help uh, uh, illustrate is that uh, worm blobs are a tractable model system that allows us to study these tangled active matter or uh, living polymers, if you will, and also they may help shed some insight into how we may design flexible soft robots. To give some context here, um, this is an image from a review paper from Soft Matter we wrote a few months ago. Uh, on the uh, x-axis, you can see that we basically are expanding our aspect ratio going from kind of uh, spherical or ellips ellipsoidal to very, very highly asymmetric uh, stretchy, flexible systems. And on the y-axis, we go from passive to active systems. So classically, our colleagues here at Georgia Tech or others study staple-like systems, so they can form an entangled system, which is yeah, passive, or other colleagues study bird nests, which are slightly more uh, elongated structures. And there is an active community in the passive system thinking about polymer physics. But if you want to inject activity in these systems, uh, you know, folks study uh, fire ant rafts, uh, David Hu and Dan Goldman at Georgia Tech, uh, which are these, you know, there is entanglement. But if you imagine stretching out this aspect ratio of the individual agents or uh, uh, individual filaments, you can start to get these really topologically tangled systems, which are worm blobs. And each of these systems inspires uh, engineers and uh, roboticists to build systems that might take advantage of this complexity. For example, people have designed robots that are made of robots using these tangling structures. 
And uh, independently, uh, folks at Harvard have built these soft dangling robots that might be emergent grippers and so on and so forth. And so that's kind of the vision where worm blobs might sit in just to kind of give you a context. Um, to kind of put this uh, uh, in the context of collective systems, uh, historically, we've studied these uh, spherical uh, colloidal-like systems, whether in fire ants, just like I said, or penguins or beehives. Um, and as you start to, uh, again, stretch this, you may think about uh, worms, which may, or caterpillars that may actually form these chains and maggots, um, and then worm blobs sit right on the end. The point I wanted to uh, kind of uh, emphasize here is as we move across by just taking these systems and stretch uh, them in these highly anisotropic uh, filaments, what we get is this beautiful uh, emergence of both topological complexity as well as geometric complexity. So the staples may have uh, limited geometrical entanglement they may do, or the bird's nest may have due to their stiffness, uh, a certain amount of uh, geometric uh, tanglements they may form, so as the ants. And really what the worm blobs uh, embody is, or give us an example of, is how to harness this complexity to do some useful functions, which hopefully I'll share, and then we can kind of learn from this and kind of embrace this complexity to do some useful tasks in synthetic systems. Um, this work, uh, we've been very fortunate to do both with uh, grad students and postdocs. So some of the work I'll share with you is with Harry, Yasmin, and Vishal, uh, but also my colleagues who help us, whether with robotics and uh, uh, doing some of the modeling work. So this is kind of my acknowledgement. So with this, I'll share with you kind of the genesis of how we started on these warm blobs. I did my PhD uh, at Stanford, and some of you might recognize this uh, uh, beautiful image. This is the Lake Lagunita, um, and there's the Hoover Tower, just to cont uh, contextualize you. And uh, the five years that I was at Stanford doing my PhD, uh, uh, this is California, so there was a drought and no water in this lake, which is why it looks so yellow. However, I also did my postdoc and continued staying there. And one year in 2016, there was a lot of rain. It rained for a couple of days. Um, and uh, uh, me, along with almost every person on campus, we were very excited to see water and uh, people brought out their kayaks. And I wanted to go take a walk and essentially ask the question, a lake which is dry for so many years, what kind of life emerges in a lake that just freshly filled with water? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I stumbled upon these uh, worms where some of the water was receded and uh, as any um, uh, 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 scientist would do, it took a stick and poked into it and the soft matter, a person in me uh, basically was very, very happy to see that this was, you know, squiggly and uh, squishy. Um, and at that time, I knew I was going to start my faculty position. So this seemed like an interesting curiosity to kind of pursue. Um, and they are not just outside the water. Uh, uh, this is a video from my iPhone showing that these worms in many places were quite happy inside the water. They hang out in the granular media. This is me stealing a pipette and trying to catch some of these worms. In this video, it's not successful, but I was able to uh, get them out. So these worms live in semi-aquatic kind of regions. They're California black worms. Um, and when I started my lab at Georgia Tech, this was one of the first projects we started. These are Lumbriculus variegatus. Um, they're about half a millimeter in diameter and can grow up to three centimeters in length. So it's a huge aspect ratio to these uh, greater than 100, extremely flexible, fine uh, worms, uh, and they can move both in air and water. But really the magic here is if you take thousands of them, so you have 50,000 worms uh, held by Yasmin um, in the lab. And this is during the pandemic where everybody was, uh, you know, uh, baking bread uh, and playing with dough, we were playing with this, uh, this worm blob system that feels and uh, behaves just like a living uh, dough. You hear it flows between Yasmin's uh, fingers. Um, we can even make a ball and uh, we can throw it on the ground. It doesn't bounce much, but bounce much, but it's a very cohesive tangled system. And all this is, is just 50,000 worms with just a little bit of water to, you know, to keep them wet. Uh, that naturally coats their bodies. So we can take these uh, worms and we can make small blobs, uh, a little bit larger blobs. And uh, depending on the university you are at or the 
journal you want to submit your paper ahead, you can coax them into, you know, uh, forming some patterns. Um, but the, these are out of water. Typically in our lab, we have millions and millions of these worms and they basically we culture them in these aquatic uh, aquariums and they are typically happy uh, staying burrowed with their heads in this granular matter, feeding on detritus and uh, hanging around in these patchy systems uh, and just uh, uh, this is kind of their happy state and how we culture them. So given the restraint on time today, I'm going to tell you one story. Uh, however, if you're interested, we've been, as I said, working on them for six, seven years, um, and we've been able to appreciate uh, how these worms kind of break symmetry and locomote, and we've been able to build some robotic systems. Uh, we've applied kind of this active polymer physics principles to start to build, uh, use some computational methods to understand how they may uh, exhibit emergent behavior. We think of these as kind of these tangled active matter systems. So we've thought about how to sculpt them, how to engage with them um, through both uh, experiments, but also simulations and also uh, just kind of uh, uh, embracing and enjoying the emergent biology and the biomechanics. We've been studying how these worms kind of, uh, you know, engage with environmental perturbations and just studying kind of some, some of the basic biological features of this. So some papers over here, um, if uh, happy to answer questions on these, but also for uh, in case you want to dig deeper into this. Today's story, I'll try to tell you one story that the we've learned from these worm blobs. And really there's, uh, uh, Kind of the context here is uh, about uh, uh, a couple of couple of hundred years ago, Alexander the Great uh, ventures upon this uh, tiny town of Gordon, and uh, the ancient Greek myth goes that. Uh, uh, that anybody who actually uh, is able to solve this uh, knot made of ropes on this ox cart will go on to rule all of Asia. And so Alexander the Great, I think about that time, he was 16 or 18, being this young, dashing, uh, ambitious uh, person, uh, decides to, you know, kind of uh, solve this guardian knot by taking out his sword and cutting it. Um, of course, uh, we all know the history is that he goes on to uh, uh, conquer all of Asia. Uh, however, today in 2023, all of us may not have similar aspirations, but not still, uh, uh, you know, uh, give us some uh, uh, challenges in real life, whether with our Ethernet cables or uh, headphones. And so kind of the uh, fundamental question here is we'd like to uh, see is what can worms teach us about thinking about these uh, tangles and knots? Um, here's a beautiful video helping you appreciate. Uh, a bird's eye view. Uh, it's a dish with worms in it, uh, real time. And you can start to appreciate that these worms really do use their bodies to form braids and really form these complex tangles and play this once or twice, uh, just for you to see that they're really active and dynamic uh, structure builders. This video illustrates the worms, uh, each of the worms kind of innate behavior to try to wind and braid around each other. And as they do so, they start to pull around each other, which kind of gave us that cohesive feature of a 50,000 worm blob that you can kind of play with and hold in your own hands because they're truly tangled and kind of forming these topological braids with each other's bodies as they wind around. So, um, hopefully this illustrates that these worms can form these topological tangles. What Harry, a PhD student, uh, kind of serendipitously uh, discovered is that if you see this uh, tangled blob in the left side corner of the aquarium, where they're pretty happy and existing, uh, is if he shine, shines a UV light on them, uh, he saw that they basically untangle very, very rapidly and they essentially spread apart and they break this cohesive tangle. Um, here's the video that actually shows you in real time how uh, quickly this process happens. So here we're basically giving them a gentle sh gentle shock with a nine volt battery. And I'll play this in slow motion. So we had to actually use a high speed camera to really capture this because it's happening within the blink of an eye. Um, you can see that this cohesive ball or knot of these worms rapidly untangles, uh, which is remarkable if you could uh, actually do this with our ethernet cables, but of course these are living filaments. And so that's the kind of uh, puzzle we are after today that I'll share. Um, 
how do these worms quickly unravel a complex tangle? Um, I don't know, Mo, you're probably keeping an eye on chat, but if there are any burning clarifications so far, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, I keep marching forward. Okay, keep going on. Yeah, the question, just the question we have, we'll take at the end. Okay, awesome. So the first step, uh, as with uh, any of these collective and tagal systems, um, uh, all of us have to contend with is really characterizing this tangle, really uh, peering into this uh, tangle, if you will. And uh, just to give you context, uh, if anybody on this uh, Zoom call is studies fire ants or bees or any of these collectives, you'll or even in cellular systems, uh, DNA tangles, we, we appreciate that this is really one of the challenging things to see this in 3D. Um, same thing for the worms. And this slide is one of those slides uh, I both love and hate is because it took us a year and a half to actually basically make the slide that you see. So it represents a lot of uh, uh, tears and efforts. But essentially, after trying many different method methods of imaging this, we uh, stumble upon ultrasound as our uh, medium, and we've been able to use ultrasound to actually the same thing as uh, uh, if you go uh, for a pregnancy test and uh, you you might be able to see um, an embryo uh, or a fetus. We basically use the same ultrasound and then do some segmentation and some manifold learning uh, to essentially get uh, a full 3D reconstruction of a warm blob. In this case, it's about 12 filaments. Um, but now we can actually start to do something because we now have a representation of this one. Um, a lot of this work that I'm showing was uh, 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 done with Vishal and Yon, our co collaborators at uh, uh, MIT, and Vishal is now a postdoc at Stanford. So the first question as we get this tangle is we can start to now compare uh, pairwise filaments. And a appreciation here is that we can define kind of a link number. So if in, I'm pulling out two filaments, so blue and a green and a green and a red. And you can start to see that in this case, I have to move uh, uh, the zoom window, is uh, the, the blue and the green are basically not tangling with each other or not linked to each other. Uh, but on the right-hand side column, you can start to see that the orange and green um, or the blue and yellow actually start to tangle with each other. And to kind of appreciate this, we define a linking number, which essentially helps us uh, identify in this tangle which two filaments or which two worms are linked to each other and which are not. And so um, a intuition here is that for two closed curves, if you have a linking number that is not zero, essentially suggests that they're, they're linked together and the energy barrier to separate them is high. And a linking number of zero just means that they might be placed on top of each other um, and uh, they might not be topologically linked. Um, now, these are illustrations are for closed curves. Uh, uh, hopefully, all of you appreciate that these fil worm filaments are open curves, and we had to augment this uh, formulation for open curves, which is uh, which we've done, and the details are in the supporting information. But essentially, we can kind of draw a threshold and have this linking number less than half suggest that these two open curves are not linked. Linking number greater than half uh, suggests that these two curves are linked. Um, a second uh, feature to characterize this is something that we have to include is the ability of these filaments to contact. The intuition here is that if two if two of these worms are far apart and are linked, uh, that's not so useful. So worms need to both be in contact and uh, also be linked to each other. And so we basically uh, use the metric of a contact link number. Um, essentially saying that worms that uh, uh, contact link less than half are both touching and linking with each other and contact link greater than half is uh, worms that are touching and linked. What we're trying to do here is essentially form a sparse representation uh, to characterize our worm tangle and this contact link matrix is a very useful way to do this. So in this uh, uh, representation on the left-hand side, you can see each worm, so we have 12 worms, so you can think of them uh, as each of these colored dots represent each worm and the basically uh, the lines, the red lines, uh, uh, reveal uh, how many worms are in contact and linked with each other. And we essentially can get a mean degree connectedness of out of this network uh, kind of representation or even calculate a total contact link per worm. The takeaway here for 
couple of these ultrasounds of these blobs that we've done is we found that each worm on average is linked with uh, or braids with two other worms in these uh, uh, in these tangles. Um, which gives us kind of a handle about how these worms are actually um, linking and braiding with each other. So on average, uh, each worm is linked with two worms. Um, so this gives us a static picture. And the next thing, as we're trying to, again, answer this question of how the worms are untangling, we now have an understanding of the initial state of these worms. But now we have to encode in and think about the dynamics. And to start to do this, we uh, essentially developed a, a Kirchhoff model with some activity. And so these are basically uh, a simple Kirchhoff model with some activity on the head. It's random. But you can already start to see it behaves a little bit like a worm. Uh, but uh, this is uh, essentially a random forcing function. So we now need to watch the worms, learn what their head gate trajectories is, and then imp impart them into our model to really be able to capture what the trajectories of the uh, untangling or tangling dynamics would be, which is what we did. So on the left-hand side is a video of these worms doing their tangling, and we track their heads. And the same thing in high-speed video of their untangling, where they seem to exhibit kind of these... Uh, seemingly very complicated gates, but we'll break them down a little bit. And if I take one worm and uh, in a high-speed video watch its untangling gate, we observe something remarkable is that these worms seem to do this figure eight kind of a helical motion. So they form essentially a figure eight and then they switch. So they'll go right and I'll play this video again and they'll form a loop and then they change their direction and they'll form a figure eight from the left-hand side. And so this kind of gives us a clue as to a pathological or a stereotypical gait that these worms are using. And with this, we can create kind of a simple uh, uh, parameterized model. So if you take the worm head and you prescribe that it's moving at a velocity and uh, you, it'll make a right or a left turn, and this tangential velocity, uh, we, can, uh, we can kind of uh, prescribe uh, this angular velocity as a alpha, then we, kind of it, it gives us an intrinsic time scale of these worms as one by alpha. What this already reveals to us is that the worms can basically turn uh, you know at a slow speed uh, when they're untangling or at a fast speed, which is why we need this high speed camera to capture the untangle. But inherently there is a second time scale and the time scale, the second one uh, is which is the switching. So they may be turning right, but then they can the head will turn left. And how fast or slow it switches is encoded in this chirality number, which takes the intrinsic time scale alpha with a lambda. The intuition here is this if chirality number gamma is greater than one, then the turning rate, the switching rate, sorry, is very, very slow. And the head traces these loops uh, as it forms. And this is necessary for tangling. But if chirality number is less, it's switching very, very quickly and it forms this kind of figure eight motions. And this is kind of the untangling gate. The nice thing about here is that we've kind of captured both the tangling and untangling in one number, which is the chirality number. And switching this basically uh, moves us between tangling and untangling. And indeed, if we put them into our simulations with multi-filaments, we can see on the left-hand side, which is the tangling mode, um, where the heads are forming these loops, it leads to these, uh, you know, uh, blob formation because you can see in the topological, the kind of a contact link representation, you can see that the worms aggregate and form these tangles. Whereas on the right hand side, I'll play this video again, we start from an initial state which was based on our ultrasound, and you can see if the gamma is less in which they switch quickly and form these figure eights, they untangle. So they start from a tangled state and this leads to this quick untangling. So you have two minutes left to finish the story, sorry. Cool, um, sounds good. Maybe I missed my uh, time, okay, all right. Um, one of the things we were uh, able to do is to capture this uh, representation using a mean field approach so that we could kind of create a phase diagram. And uh, essentially here, each of the other worms is represented by kind of a post and the worm kind of moving through this maze. And uh, I'm gonna skip through uh, some of these details in the interest of time, but essentially in this mean field approach, we're able to kind of redefine our chirality number, which is again, how fast or slow it's switching, as well as a loop number, uh, which captures the geometric aspects of these worms. Uh, representing kind of how far apart uh, uh, these worms are. 
And I'll give you the punchline. Essentially, in this phase diagram of uh, this loop number uh, uh, and the chirality number, uh, we can create this phase diagram that shows the tangling index. What tangling index represents is zero means these worms are not tangled. Um, and tangling index of four represents a very, very tangled state. Um, and two is where we've chosen to represent in white. If you remember, the worms were in this tangled state of approximately two, where each worm tangles with about two other worms. And what we find is that in these mean field approaches, we can kind of find out where these worms might be um, on different gamma. So you can have them in the low tangling state with gamma 0.4 illustrated, and then on the higher tangling state in red. And essentially, if we put all the worm data on top, which is here, we can see that the worms and the space diagram kind of uh, blend in quite nicely. And a key takeaway here that we realize is that the worms are not choosing their loop number as much, but they're actually choosing gamma to go between tangling and untangling. So as they go from higher tangling, which is the purple dots, uh, they move left, which is they ch change their switching gates uh, and they switch much more often to form these figure eights, they can go into the untangling domain. A nice puzzle here is this white line, which is the tangling index of two, which is actually the critical tanglings a critical tangling index. What that means is each filament is tangled with two other filaments. And that holds a nice mathematical puzzle, which we think is also key to why these worms can quickly untangle. Um, and essentially, uh, the puzzle, uh, for lack of time, essentially means this is a mathematical puzzle that how do you hang a, how do you hang a picture such that if you remove, a, uh, remove one of these uh, pegs, the picture falls. Um, so in this case, uh, the answer is to form this kind of a uh, knot and our modeling uh, with these critical tangling re reveals that the worm untangling holds kind of a uh, similar uh, principle as to this kind of topological tying. Essentially, what that means is that the worms are sitting at this edge of a critical tangling so that it gives them a topological quick, re quick release mechanism, and, and that's how they're able to quickly uh, untangle. Um, Apologies for rushing in the end, but essentially uh, we've been able to use the biological worms and uh, topological kind of principles and simulations to uh, appreciate uh, both a phase diagram, but also show how we can reversibly tangle and untangle. Um, and hopefully I've shared with you uh, at least some to show you that the worm blob is a fascinating system that allows us to study many aspects of tangled active matter. Um, and we've done with our colleagues and us, we've done quite a lot of different experiments uh, of soft matter. It's like a nice playground. Um, and with that, I'll pause and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Saad, for a very, very exciting and wonderful talk. So uh, I have a question here from Shen Ring, and they're asking, they're saying the worm video, I think this is one of your very early videos. The worm video is reminiscent of actin filament networks under contraction. Can you comment on the comparison between the two? Um, I, I wonder if uh, that's the video there. Yeah, I think it's this to. video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's a good point and, uh, have to, uh, think a little bit more because I haven't, um, seen kind of the active network contraction. There are similarities, um, and, uh, perhaps differences, but yeah, at the, at the moment without, uh, thinking a little bit carefully, can't comment, uh, much, but, uh, I think, yeah, there's these are filaments that are active, and so they do form these uh, networks, but uh, maybe there are differences in the kinetics and uh, binding on and off and how the motors are connecting the actomyosin network. So. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick question. I don't see any other questions, but I had a quick one, which is that if you have injection of, like if you inject food or nutrients, right, especially in the high density of worms, does it change your untangling in any way? Like if you're pumping energy in the system locally in some places? So the untangling mechanism is already very, very energetically um, okay. uh, demanding for each of the worms. And it's a very brief, it's an escape mechanism. So mm -hmm. to the best of our knowledge, adding any more food or anything won't change already. They are basically trying to escape. So it's an energetically okay, 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 favorable okay. state for them. Okay. Uh, then there is another quick question, then we'll move on from Ashok. Why do they like being tangled? What is the biology behind it? Yeah, so I skipped this, but let's see if I can uh, give you a uh, quick answer. 
have it in one of these slides. So essentially, uh, we found, if you can see this slide, is that it helps them. Uh, there are two reasons which we think it helps them uh, protect against evaporation. So when they form a blob outside water, we found that it helps in survival. So a single worm will die in a few minutes. But if that same worm is in a thousand worm blob, it reduces its evaporation. However, we've also found that these worm blobs uh, exhibit emergent properties. So in biology, people have found these worm tangles to help survival in harsh environments such as sewer caves and uh, sulfur caves. So there's still more to learn, but these are you know, hopefully uh, early answers, but there's more to figure out, but it's essentially a survival mechanism against harsh environments. Thank you. That completely makes sense. Once again, th 